Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. We are opening hearing 11 of the 184th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. It is an ex-official hearing entitled Situation of Union and Legal Rights in Cuba. My name is Julissa Mantilla Falcón. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Today with me are Estuardo Rallón, first vice president of the commission, also Commissioner Joel Hernandez, rapporteur for um, Human Rights Defenders and Commissioner Carlos Bernal, Rapporteur for Persons with Disabilities. Also with us are Maria Claudia Pulido and the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Muñoz. I would like to greet civil society organizations. We will start the hearing with your participation for 40 minutes. After that, the commission will have the floor for another um, conforme hacen uso de la palabra. Entonces iniciamos la audiencia, tiene la palabra la sociedad civil. Gracias. Bueno, eh, en realidad no sé cuál es el orden. Pero... In fact, I don't know if we have an order, but maybe I can start. Yes. Go ahead. Well, my name is Omar Lopez Montenegro, and I'm here on behalf of the Coalición de Cuentas Provistas Cubanos, or the Cuban Self-Employed Workers Coalition. We are a self-employed workers group in Cuba. As you know, the word self-employed is a way of defining a small business owners. So I would like to talk today about the main problem that is affecting self-employed workers in Cuba. First, the legal and political system in Cuba, Title II of the new constitution enacted in Cuba from 2019 establishes the following in its article 18, title two. The Republic of Cuba has a system of socialist economy based on the property of the people on fundamental production means. This is the main property form and it's a planified econ a plant economy. So any self-employed worker or any business should be um, covered by the plant economy system or the socialist economy system. Article 19 of the constitution establishes that the state directs, regulates, and controls economic activity. As a result, the fundamental issue that self-employed workers face in Cuba is the monopoly of the state over economic activity. Technically speaking, some people may believe that there is some openness because Some people are allowed to have certificates and to work on their own. Also, all their services or goods need to be sold to the state. They cannot trade their goods and services freely. Everything has to be sold to the state of Cuba. They control everything. In 2021, SMEs had to be socialist. That is what was established. So there is a single model of production imposed on society. And this is against the freedom of exercising economic activity by self-employed workers. Another important issue that we can mention is that 90% of private um, businesses in Cuba are low intensity uh, activities. 
the manufacturing of food, uh, transportation of passengers, the rent of houses and rooms. Why is this happening? Because large economic activities or are conducted with through joint ventures with foreign companies. This includes a whole hotel industry or tourism. All those activities are conducted together with the state and Cuban citizens are not allowed to participate by law. Cuban citizens cannot invest in the hotel industry. They cannot be a hotel. They cannot create a joint venture with a foreign business. This is prohibited by law. This prohibition directly and indirectly affects the capacity of self-employed workers to grow and to expand um, because most of the activities of self-employed workers are just for survival. Only 36 SMEs, that is 88% of all companies in Cuba have been able to conduct foreign trade operations. However, foreign trade operations should be conducted through an intermediary. There are 43 state and companies that are authorized to be intermediaries in these foreign, opera foreign trade operations. That is the business owner can establish any commercial relationship directly with a foreign company. Self-employed workers in Cuba cannot belong to unions. They can only be members of unions controlled by the state. This includes the Central Workers Union of Cuba and the Association of Cuban Self-Employed Workers have sent a request to be legally registered four times, but we have had no answer. I also would like to mention the situation of vulnerable populations. What are the sectors that are most vulnerable? Children and Afro-descendant persons. This is significant because we know that this affects most of Cuban population. Most of Cuban population is made up of women and Afro-descendants. The owners of licenses and certificates in Cuba that can exercise their own business activities. We know that Afro-descendants account for 8% while women account for 12%. So, it is a country in which Afro-descendants account for 60% of the population, according to some estimates. Women account for 59% of the Cuban population. So there is a pattern to leave women Afro-descendants behind. Another group that is being left behind are university graduates. University graduates cannot exercise their professions on their own. Some of them work as professors or teachers. That is the only way in which they can use their own expertise, but they cannot have their own businesses. And as a result, Many professionals have to work in these jobs. They are better paid than state jobs, but they cannot develop their profession fully. So they work as food manufacturers, etc. Although in Cuba, the right to work 
is enshrined in the constitution and also the freedom to choose a job is enshrined in the constitution. The legal framework imposed by the government limits the ability of workers to decide where, where they want to work. And also, there is a prohibition of Cuban citizens to be owners. And this is a limitation to the freedom to choose a job. Um, therefore, the right to have your own business and company is limited. Also, there is a prohibition of doctors and nurses with HIV they cannot participate in several national programs. They cannot participate in several areas. And there is an important figure that I would like to share with you. 625,000 university graduates have not been able to exercise their profession in the private sector because of the legal framework. This leads to a situation in which professionals work in jobs that are better paid than their professional jobs, but their professional capacity is not developed. The legal framework of Cuba establishes the protection of all workers by the state of Cuba. There is a law against labor exploitation, which is recognized internationally. However, the state of Cuba has ignored this, especially in the private sector. There are some restaurants in which people work for over 90 hours a week. Thank you, Mr. Lopez for your information. Uh, since there are several civil uh, society organizations today, um, I would like to give the floor to other organizations. So now I would like to give the floor to Kubalex. So let's give the floor to Kubalex. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, my name is Alain Espinosa. I'm one of the lawyers of Cuba Lex, and we would like to uh, talk about uh, what happens in social media. For example, there is a mother who is asking support because she doesn't know what to say to her daughters when they tell her that they are hungry and she has to send them without food to school. For example, there is another case of a four-year girl that has body paralysis and has no access to health. We are seeing an economic crisis that is affecting all the population. And this has been worsened by the regulations established in 2021, in spite of the pandemic, this policy is discriminatory and has affected inequalities and has especially affected those social groups in a situation of vulnerability. This means Afro-descendants, women, children, persons with disabilities, adults over 65 years old and migrant and internally displaced person. Out of the 11 million people in the population only 5 million receive the benefits of this policy, state workers, pensioners, and the groups who receive state aid. We see an increase of 9.6 times of state owners, but of state uh, workers. We see that the average increase for most of the workers was only 4.1 times and therefore those employees who do not work in the public sector are not benefited. We see that the policy has had several failures since its implementation. We need to say that the minimum salary has increased but the purchasing power of the population has decreased due to inflation. 
the cost of basic goods has increased 7.9 times. And also there has been an increase in the cost of electricity in the housing sector. This is an energy crisis with cuts in the system. And this worsens or hinders the normal life of families in Cuba. In recent days, for example, Amelia Cansadilla, a mother, cómo les afecta la crisis alimentaria y energética. En el caso de Amelia, agotó todos los mecanismos internos ante seis instituciones sin poder recibir ninguna solución a sus problemas. Nosotros tenemos que apuntar que, aunque en Cuba, los derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales técnicamente podrían defenderse vía jurisdicción contenciosa administrativa, es un requisito sine qua non agotar previamente los recursos de las vías administrativas y judiciales. Esto hace que el proceso sea excesivamente dilatado. So, the process In case there is a decision against the interests of the person who is filing the complaint, this person could not resort to the constitutional channels uh, through the uh, law that protects constitutional rights, and this is going to violate uh, his or her rights. The lack of possibility to enjoy uh, life with dignity, it adds up to the lack of possibility of defending social, economic and cultural rights because of the lack of remedies. On uh, our part, I would like to say that we have sent by email a complimentary report about this presentation when we offer further information. Thank you. I will now give the floor to uh, the representatives of Cuido 60. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for letting us uh, participate in this event. I am Eliana Costa, Executive Director, Director of Guido 60, which is an observatory of human rights in Cuba. And I'm going to make reference in this presentation to the multiple discrimination that exists regarding labor rights affecting the elderly and other uh, labor groups. I'm sorry, vulnerable groups, uh, labor rights in particular regarding elderly and the violation uh, regarding the care work that affects uh, women working at home and paid domestic workers. This is part of the work we have carried out in Cuido 60 uh, to map and provide assistance to the elderly and we are registering violation of rights and this is being developed and we have published that in our website. I'd like to make reference to the legislation in Cuba. There are great inequalities in the labor code. There are uh, wide labor rights recognized for many persons in connection to uh, care and maternity leave, but there are inequalities uh, according to the type of employer, whether it is the state or a private employer. In the non-state uh, um, sector, uh, labor rights are restricted. They lack warranties, they're uh, fragile, are not well regulated. And also systematically, there's a violation of fiscalization uh, channels, sometimes they're in existence, and there are no institutional mechanisms to guarantee the rights of the persons working uh, with contracts. The labor code it does not work outside the state sector, especially for domestic work. It is a sector that in most uh, countries, it is uh, something that it does not include any contracts. We lack uh, official statistics in connection with self-employed persons, which hinders a follow-up and control of the sector. Those statistics uh, 
present different failures as they do not make a distinction between uh, owners and employers, which hides behind a category of self-employed persons, uh, people who go through different situations. And in connection with other topics, there are great legal lacunes. There is a union pressure and self-employed persons uh, suffer pressure from suffer pressure so the possibility of defending uh, workers rights are uh, scarce state unions are the only ones allowed uh, in cuba that is at the level of the normative now I would like to talk about access to the labor market. There's great inequality to access paid um, work in Cuba, affecting mostly elderly women, Afro-descendants, and persons who live in rural areas. We need to say that inequalities are expressed at the level of the territory in Cuba, and elder men have greater access to work outside their homes, women uh, continue carrying out most of care uh, tasks, even when they are old. And this has been reinforced after the pandemic. And due to the current legislation, the presence of uh, women in the labor market has been reduced the rate of participation of women in uh, the labor market is one of the lowest in the region. And we need to say that the set of other ways uh, of discrimination in the labor sector that are invisible uh, in the Cuban space, this uh, lack of regulation, for example, due to age, race, or gender, uh, when uh, job vacancies are uh, posted, uh, this discrimination exists at the level of labor conditions, the lack of regulations of working uh, days that may be of 12 hours a day for self-employed persons. This is something repeated. The limitation of labor rights affects women in particular. The level of informality in the labor market has increased significantly in the last year as a result, especially of how this is organized and the impact, but the data about informal uh, jobs uh, is insufficient in Cuba and it affects the elderly in particular. And I would like to close mentioning the sector of domestic workers, women domestic workers. There is lack of uh, research and information about this sector. There are some research in that regard, but there's no legal specific regulation for this uh, activity. This activity for our self-employed workers has been allowed and it has increased from 200 to 2,000 um, permissions, but it's a lack of registration of persons uh, working as domestic workers without um, permission, the lack of um, if working conditions and, and the increase of precarious working conditions in this sector is uh, significant. Now I will give the floor to prisoners defendant. Now prisoners defendant is the uh, next speaker. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to share my screen in order to share a presentation and try to be as fast as possible. I've been told that Cadal, Rachel Pira, and Gabriel Salvia had the, have given me some minutes so that I can uh, complete my presentation. So let's see if I can be fast. I'm going to talk about medical measures, uh, members of the Navy, for example, uh, professors, artists, 
uh, elite sports persons. There is a eight year law in Cuba. I'm going to mention all the legislation. I'm going to be quick and leave the uh, link to the complete presentation. More than 5,000 parents cannot see their children for at least eight years. They are punished. They are punished and that's why their small children are sanctioned as well. This is uh, executed through criminal code, in particular uh, 135, article 135. Today, that is article 176. And it says whether you leave your work or you do not uh, come back to Cuba after concluding your work, you have um, a privation of liberty from three to eight years. You are qualified as emigrated. That is to say uh, that all your rights or your assets are taken from you for eight years. Inadmissible means that you cannot uh, enter the country. For example, a member of the Navy, uh, the Select Mar is the Cuban company that tells the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that these are the persons who have not uh, come back. These are the defectors. We can see the name of the ship here. There were six. Then the Ministry of the Interior immediately issues a certificate saying that the mission has been abandoned. It makes reference to all institutions of the state that uh, do not doubt in qualifying this uh, situation as defectors. Here we can see original documents in which they say that the Cuban citizen declares as such loses his residency in Cuba automatically and he is denied it, his entrance to the country for eight years. We have several examples and they all say the same. It says that if you do not come back after your uh, job is completed, you cannot come back to Cuba. This is the declaration of mi migrate and all his properties and uh, assets are taken from him. It's inadmissible because migration law as foreign offices and consular offices explain, I can provide Article 24.1 says that uh, in connection to the entrance to the national territory, it's inadmissible to all person that has been declared as undesired. That's how they, these thousands of persons that are punished cannot enter the country. More than 40,000 historically, now they are eight or 10,000 and their uh, children, their spouses or parents cannot leave the country. But under which conditions given doctors work? through a contract with a foreign uh, multinational or a company signed by the government. They perceive uh, five to 20% of the salaries. They have, they have to go back to Cuba or lose everything. They are subject to Cuban law resolution 368 and they have to pay uh, to uh, communist organizations. They are taking their passports. They cannot take with them their legalized or apostled um, uh, diplomas, and they cannot marry in the uh, country uh, in which they work. This is the same uh, scheme, um, the same uh, context as human trafficking. First, we had a resolution 168 of 2010. Previous to that, 368 of 2020, that is not affecting people right now. And resolution 368 is the same as 168. These disciplinary rules of procedures for civil workers abroad. Among their duties, they mentioned coming back to Cuba. The next thing is to 
uh, report to the immediate superior about the uh, relationships with foreigners or nationals to request for authorizations to travel to provinces or other uh, cities. But if we see the infractions, we can see that they cannot participate in social acts without authorization. They cannot leave the country. Uh, they cannot live with non-authorized persons. They cannot have relationships with any person that uh, has uh, behaviors that oppose the principles of Cuba. They cannot report presence they get, whether they're related to their work or not, or manage uh, invitations for their uh, relatives. They keep an aparte for the um, relatives. They are trapped in Cuba. They cannot drive means of transport, whether the, in spite of the fact that they have a license. This is amazing. Between 50,000 and 10, and 100,000 professionals are affected every year. Only medical doctors, uh, there are many. 7,000 uh, merchant navy um, officers, and there are many examples. Why does this happen? Because this represents income for Cuba, $8.5 million. If we compare that to tourism, which is 2.9 million, and the countries that are involved in this unfortunate execution of slavery, which is a crime against uh, humanity, which is a criminal type, according to the Institute of Rome and the International Court, these are more than 100 uh, countries. There are many countries involved that are not interested in this uh, being known. Before the mission, they are trapped in Cuba. Their only possible way out is to leave Cuba because professionals cannot have a regular passport. Migration law says that they are giving a passport to a temporal passport to leave the uh, country. The problems that they have in customs were they are too many, but they are terrible. Professionals cannot be freed. Uh, they call this freedom to stop being a medical doctor to leave the country. You have to wait for five years because um, the professional has to be substituted, but they do this in a very fast way. But if you want to be free, this is very hard. If you leave the country, you go to prison. That is the punishment. And there are persons who are in prison because they have illegally left the country. This is something that is applied. Um, professionals or graduates cannot go abroad without the authorization of the party. Uh, regarding workers and athletes require authorization to travel abroad. Among that, we have gathered more than a thousand uh, testimonies and there are terrible statistics. For example, 75% were not voluntaries. And many of them were conditions out of uh, limitations of mobility, misery or precarious labor conditions. And in many cases, 12%, they were, uh, this was a result of uh, coercive uh, actions. Most of them are medical doctors, but they are American Navy officers and other uh, professions as well. They live without a contract. That is to say, they offer a contract and they get a copy of this contract, only 32%. Why? Because these include all declarations or testimonies from Brazil. This uh, was one of the few countries that provided a contract, but 35% didn't even know their destination. And 73% said that they had to participate in a Communist Party course to reinforce revolutionary principles. These are the courses. These are the certificates of the courses. Um, ideological, political preparations to uh, workers of the health sector. So apart from medical treatment and uh, drugs, they have to know about this. And all these organizations have said something about it. Not only the United Nations, the Inter-American Community, the uh, European Parliament, Human Rights Watch, Many organizations have said many things throughout the years. I am missing here uh, an 
Amnesty International is not included here. And it's very important because there are 50 or 100,000 persons suffering from this slavery. Uh, finally, the Committee on the Rights of the Children um, has uh, explained that persons should these obstacles for uh, family regroupations should be allowed. This is a resolution issued by the Committee on the Rights of the Children. And we have seen these statistics uh, coming out of the testimonies. Most of them suffer surveillance. They cannot spend the night uh, outside the place that has been assigned. And the mission in Brazil has confirmed this. Um, in Brazil, the slavery was not as serious as in Guatemala or Venezuela or Mexico. And there are statistics that are of that are really terrible. We will see some of them, 55% being most of them doctors, uh, were made to falsely increase uh, statistics. They are forging all these statistics of all medical um, missions so that the WHO has uh, statistics that are not true. 80% of patients in Mission Milagro were not patients. These uh, were patients or names taken from the phone uh, records and I had to complete 30 uh, visits a day or patients a day, um, but people didn't come to the mission. So they had to complete the mission with made up names or, um, and if they leave that mission, they, they couldn't go back to the country for 80 years. They work 70 hours a day uh, on average and 74% suffer or see how their colleagues suffer uh, threats. 41%, and this is quite serious, suffer sexual harassment. Women, female doctors suffer constant uh, sexual harassment in their missions because the heads of the mission are uh, choose the women that they like. And under this framework of repression, if they do not comply with uh, what they ask for, they... Um, attack them some of them were able to escape and that's some of the testimonies that we were able to gather we have analyzed 47 countries and the uh, repression taking into account international agreements on human rights and we can see uh, statistics regarding uh, repression that have to do with surveillance, um, social human rights and uh, identity and movement exploitation, um, among others. The missions of Navy officers as well, they suffer exploitation, threats, surveillance, and in other fields, in MSC cruises, while well, they are not treated as the uh, chief of the mission in Cuba. And we have requested the Committee on the Rights of the Children. There were 95% of medical doctors. We took a very big sample and 90% were between one and three years in their last mission. 75-6% were declared defectors, and we were based on those uh, statistics, and we look for the age of their children. Separation from their children, 41% has never seen them again, 40% spent between one to five years apart, and 19% between five and nine per, uh, years. I'm sorry, Javier, I don't want to interrupt you, but we are running out of time. So I would like to you to complete this in during the second round. I only have three, four slides. 
but I will now give the floor to Aula Abierta. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sofo Sofia Lobo from Aula Abierta. We reject the regular violations of union and labor rights of professors and researchers. They are expelled of institutions because of political reasons. There has been a policy in the state in order to persecute those who think differently. This is shown, uh, for example, because of the statements of the Minister of Education of the country, um, who um, all, who said that all teachers should express the Cuban ideology. As an example of this policy, we have documented that at least 32 university professors and researchers have been victims of unjustified um, dismissals. In most of the cases that have been documented, we have identified violations of due process in the administrative area. There had been also irregularities in the creation of the files for their cases. The victims have not been able to access the files either. Taking into consideration the principles of academic freedom um, established that administrative procedures against persons in their freedom of or in their exercise of academic liberty should comply with principles such as uh, non-discrimination and transparency. The rights of university professors and researchers um, and the violations of their rights has an impact on our rights because it uh, prevents education based on science. So there is a violation of the freedom or a violation of the right to freedom or academic freedom. Hello, Sofia. Sergio, I am Sergio Angel, and I'm the coordinator of the Observatory of Cuba. Taking into consideration Agreement 169 of the ILO, the government of Cuba, through a decree, ordered the intervention of the Confederation of Workers in Cuba. It was replaced by the Central Workers Union. Justo Martinez Sanchez had the role of dismissing any union leaders who were against. Since then, union leaders have been appointed by the communist parties. For example, Ulises Anarte de Nacimento, who was appointed by the Cuban government. He was appointed as the leader of the organizing committee of the union. The law on association prevents the possibility of registering new unions or association. Therefore, it's not possible to create a new union. And the state-owned union is a political one. The observatory has covered the case of Remy Rancens, an art instructor, uh, who was dismissed because he decided not to belong to the union of where, the place where he worked. Among the behaviors that are considered serious are those are those of people who um, show that they have a different ideology from that of the ruling party. Some people, for example, were dismissed for not signing the agreements. The Observatory of Academic Freedom has documented so far 38 cases of violations to academic freedom. We can identify several cases, so that as Mr. Castellanos, Castellanos, Mrs. Ramos, among others, they were persecuted and expelled because of their political and social ideologies. What we want to show is that ideological and political persecution against teachers and students is a state policy and the violation of labor and union rights of professors has been permanent in Cuba since 1962 when university autonomy was eliminated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we will be um, um, taking away the time you stop 
Um, first, now I would like to give the floor to the rapporteur for Cuba, Estuardo Rolón. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon to my colleagues, to special rapporteurs, and to all the persons from civil society organizations. First of all, I would like to highlight what we have heard in today's hearing. These are highly striking situations. We see the violation of fundamental freedoms of people and inherent rights of people. And this leads to a systematic violation of human rights in the island. Also, there was a presentation in which there is information, data, figures with regard to the medical program in Cuba. We would like to receive that information in writing and written uh, due to the times of the hearing, the presentation could not be completed today. I would like to say that the commission is highly committed to making visible the serious violations of human rights in Cuba. We have issued several press releases. We are using social media and tweets and the special rapporteur on freedom of expression has supported several of our communications. Several of the reports and complaints that you are presenting today have been supported uh, we are a year after the large protests that took place in Cuba in July last year. And we are seeing that people are being sentenced to 8, 12, 30 years in prison because of the fact that they demand a change in the government. In order to promote the respect of human rights, we need democracy, we need democratic institutions. And since there are no democratic institutions in Cuba, uh, the commission uh, has restrictions in terms of its work. We cannot enter the island. We are using our instruments and based on our competencies, we are trying to grant precautionary measures to make the situation of violation of human rights visible. We want to be a voice that supports the huge struggles conducted by civil society organizations here and by many other people who came to the commission and those who are fighting in the island. I would like to recognize you and thank you for the information that you are providing us with. And we would like to reiterate our commitment to continue working and if you have any figures or information that you are not able to present today please send that information to the commission we will assess and analyze that information and we will act taken into consideration or with the instruments that we have at our disposal thank you so much thank you madam president thank you madam president commissioner hernandez you have the floor Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank all those who try, who participated today. I will try to be brief because I would like to listen to uh, the conclusions of some of the persons who presented today uh, in the second round of comments. As rapporteur for persons in human mobility, uh, the presentation of Mr. Larondo regarding the situation of doctors and other workers who leave Cuba and that are subjected to a situation of restriction of their rights in the country where they are and when they return to Cuba. I would like to know more about a specific situation. We were told that there are 100 countries who have received Cuban doctors over the last 57 years. But I would like to know the prior agreement between Cuba and um, receiving countries because there is a responsibility of destination countries regarding the union and the labor rights of those doctors 
who travel to those countries and Cuban professionals in those countries should be protected by domestic legislation in those countries. Otherwise, we have a legal island within those countries that receive doctors. And I think that that's as a huge concern. And another issue that I would like to know more about is the situation of Cuban doctors, and I would like to know if this issue has been taken to the ILO. I would like to know if the Committee on Union Freedom has received any complaints because the Convention on Union Freedom is from 1948. So maybe, I'm not sure, the state of Cuba is a party to that convention. I know that I can Google the answer to that question, but since you are here, I would like to know more about this to understand the whole picture of doctors from Cuba living abroad. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bernal? No, just one second. The commissioners will take the floor and then you, have, you will have time to answer the questions. Thank you for this opportunity to take the floor, Madam President. I would like to thank all the people who are brave enough to report these issues in this hearing. We know that this uh, is also, in addition to the several um, flagrant violations of human rights that we've seen in Cuba over the last decades, I would like to also ask about the situation of migrants. Um, the commission can address this situation, not only from a bilateral perspective, but also at a regional level. So I would like to know if in those destination countries, I would like to know the situation of doctors, but also of other workers. If I would like to know if there is any um consideration regarding the violations of the human rights of workers from cuba maybe these countries have special mechanisms to receive family members of cuban workers do they have any special benefits or support etc or is there any recommendation for the commission to address these issue from a regional and a structural perspective. Thank you. I would like to ask a question to Elaine Costa. I think that care policies are very important. And I would like to know if in the assessment of that those policies, uh, if there is an intersectional assessment to identify those women who are in charge of care and if there is any specific circumstances that should be taken into consideration. And also Javier was presenting important information and I would like to know what's the situation of sexual harassment. I don't know if there are any other forms of violence or such as sexual abuse. Um, I don't know if there is any specific definition for that. I would like to give the floor to Soledad Garcia Muñoz. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you to all those who are participating today. And as you know, this hearing is aimed at collecting information on union and labor rights in Cuba. We are preparing drafting a report together with Executive Secretariat of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights uh, with the leadership of country rapporteur Estuardo Rallon. And I would like to now um, celebrate the nature of this hearing. This is the first hearing of this sort and there are some interventions that i would like to explore if you have any data uh i'm talking about those who are participating in this hearing and those who are following this all uh, this hearing on social media 
please, if you have any information, we will need to document what's happening in terms of union and labor rights for the report. We want to share our concern about the situation of Cubans to choose because they don't they have so many restrictions to choose uh, their jobs. Uh, there are some specific situations that have been mentioned. We have worrisome data regarding the union and labor rights of women. We see that is an increase in the number of informal jobs in the market. Also, there are gender and racial stereotypes that limit access to dignified employment. So I would like to learn more about the situation of rural populations, uh, peasant populations or communities, rural women. We are aware that they are facing a complicated situation to access a dignified job. And also we would like to know what ha what's happening in the sector of culture and arts. Thank you so much for being here today. Now I would like to give the floor to a special rapporteur, Pedro Baca. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank all those who are participating today. Um, the information that you have provided is very important. And we hope that uh, our colleague Soledad Garcia Munoz is collecting information. Um, I would like to ask the Executive Secretariat to add this remaining time to the time for civil society organizations. So I would like to give the floor to Carolina Barreto and Race Inequality, and then to Javier um, Ailain uh, to take the floor to answer the question. So Carolina, you have the floor now. Hello, thank you so much. I will uh, be very quick. We have only four minutes. I will not talk about what my colleagues have already presented. So I would like to make five comments. First, this uh, we work, uh, this is a hearing on union and labor rights. And although we have talked about the Central Workers Union, um, it's a government organization. And therefore in Cuba, there are no unions. The Central Workers Union represents the state. And if we look at their statute, we realize that is no union. And this has serious implications because <coughs> workers have no protection. They cannot defend themselves. They cannot organize themselves. They cannot demand rights. They don't have that ability. The Central Workers Union of Cuba has a monopoly over all workers, there is no differentiation. Doctors cannot have their own union because the Central Workers Union includes all of them. And we know that doctors in Cuba are in a very difficult situation and that they face different circumstances from university professors or they are in a different situation in comparison with self-employed workers. But none of these groups can have their own union because that is prohibited. The Central Workers Union includes them all. So there is no union in Cuba. The Central Workers Union is a governmental union. So it has nothing to do with a real union. The other comment that I want to make has to do with a general aspect of work and it's about the repressive policy of the state. There is a constant threat. There is losing any job. Um, this, uh, the state is always threatening you with losing your job when you oppose their ideas, whether directly or indirect, indirectly. Depending, no matter the level of government concentration, this is so present socially, 
So sometimes you don't receive the threat from uh, the security officers of the state. It's everywhere in society. Don't do this because you are going to lose your job. This is a constant threat. You are always threatened with losing your job. And this is a way of people not being able to express their opinions against the state or the government. There is another aspect that should be highlighted um, has to do with a situation that was already mentioned. As a student and as a system teacher, um, the situation of university professors is very serious and uh, academic experts or being a professor at university is very hard. It's a situation of a lot of concern and the exercise of jurisprudence, prosecutors, when you get closer to powerful positions, you cannot express your opinion if it's contrary to the state. So you need to adhere to the official perspective or ideology. Also, uh, we talked about uh, the exploitation of doctors. I think that Javier Larondo explained this very well. I just want to sum up is that doctors are suffering a sort of slavery similar to modern slavery. The state keeps 50% of the salary. There is no right to receive a salary for your work. Doctors just receive a small part of their, uh, their salaries and the state uses those resources, uses the money from sport persons, from doctors. And there is a lot of money, a lot of income of the state that comes from the salaries of these professionals. Um, international companies in Cuba, if they want to hire Cuban people, they have to send a list, that list is approved and is a process of evaluation by Cuban authorities. There is no direct hiring process in any case. Cuban people have no right to work. They need to be authorized. They are evaluated by the state. And the independent exercise of professions such as architecture, law, engineering. I don't remember, but last year in February, 2021, a list of all these professions was published. And these professions are prohibited independence exercise or independent exercise. Um, Farmers could work the land before, but then it was prohibited. And the same happens with law. And all lawyers have to be authorized by the state to exercise law. And it's impossible to think that in a country that there are no independent lawyers. And I would like to conclude um, this with a recommendation. This is not about union or labor rights, but maybe this could be covered on another hearing on economic rights. In Cuba, we have an economic apartheid, uh, access to food, access to basic goods is through a card in a different currency to the currency of the salaries of Cubans. You have a Cuban card, but it's with an international currency, euros or US dollars. So this leads to discrimination. I wanted to mention this since the we have the special rapporteur on e, uh, ESCRs here. I am also uh, involved in art and culture, and the whole situation affects 
artists and culture workers. We all know Decree 349 and 370. You know that this affects audiovisual industry. And because of this decrease, artists join efforts. They have a very close community. And they are promoting this new cycle of protests after what happened in 2018 against the Decree 349. The decree was aimed at controlling artists and art creation. It attacked the core of artistic creation. Artists needed to have a special ID and anyone that uh, knows about uh, art knows that creation has nothing to do with ideas, but artists could not have freedom to have their own art studio. It was not having access to art galleries, but they couldn't have their own place. They couldn't have a studio. So the decree attacked the core of art creation and the resistance to that decree promoted this new cycle of protests, including the huge protests in July last year. I will now give the floor to race and equality. Good afternoon. I am Joana Villegas. On behalf of the National Institute on Race, Equality and Human Rights, we thank the invitation of the Commission to participate in this hearing about the reform of the um, criminal code. This a case is related to all the information we have gathered uh, from the organizations and the advocacy work every day. According to Constitution in January 2022, the Supreme Court of Cuba proposed a code and in May 2022, the National Assembly of Popular Power passed this new criminal code that will be uh, published in the um, official bulletin. Although the final text has not been published, the known project has raised concern in Cuba as it has an ambiguous language to establish some criminal types that the, the Cuban government has used arbitrarily to persecute the uh, enjoyment of human rights, such as freedom of expression, association, uh, specifically regarding right of association, and the time taken into account the time we have today, I'm going to make reference uh, to two articles, 274. We need to acknowledge that in Cuba, there is only a registry of associations that meant, and according to Article 3 of uh, Law of Association, the Ministry of Justice is the only one that can grant an association to be formed when it considers that the association can harm uh, social inscription de las and, um, disregard that petition. This affects independent civil society organizations that promote the defense and protection of human rights. As Carolina mentioned in 2021, the ministry is even limited this further when they created a list of activities. 124 prohibiciones. They specified that uh, self-employed work is not allowed and they also banned different research activities, um, healthcare activities, journalistic activities. This situation is worsened if we take this into account. Article a new article in the new criminal code that sanctions with prison those director of an organization that has not been authorized. Also between six months and a year and a fine to everyone that is part of an unauthorized organization. And this article also authorizes uh, sanctions such as um, assets being taken by the government. Article 143 sanctions access to um, financial resources from national or foreign sources when these includes uh, carrying out activities against the state 
this is of great concern because historically the government has considered promotion of human rights and democracy as activities against the state and the constitutional order. Members of the civil society, including activists, human rights defenders, artists, journalists, and independent union members have been called uh, counter-revolutionaries and they were uh, detained arbitrary and suffer from surveillance and other kinds of harassment. Uh, international and national uh, human rights uh, organizations make reference to this, such as the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. We request that the Cuban state respect international standards, including right to free associations without discrimination due to political reasons, to guarantee the right of free association of uh, independent civil society organizations, enabling the uh, formal constitution accessing to national and international financing, uh, refraining from criminalizing civil society organizations for legitimate uh, actions such as uh, defending human rights. That includes um, eliminating the obstacles for those persons who try to uh, exercise those rights. Javier Laronda, you have the floor. I'm going to share the presentation in order to conclude. I think that two or three slides were uh, missing. The state makes uh, trauma of children even worse because the state tells the uh, children that their uh, parents are defectors and they won't be able to come back to Cuba in eight years. According to the statistics, um, state agents are the ones telling children this. Uh, professors at school, 23% of the cases, members of the Communist Party uh, and neighbors, 10%. And children who have not received those news are count for 19%. These causes, their scientific uh, researches on this uh, subject causes anxiety, depression, behavior problems, PSD, uh, many problems. And parents, most of them being doctors, say that 70% of them suffer from emotional trauma, 59% uh, psychical trauma, 26% cognitive and mental trauma, and 29% physical trauma. But also parents suffer. And coming back to Cuba for defectors, well, in fact, they are not able to go back after eight years. Uh, many of them fear coming back because they are persecuted and they the situation is this they do not have a passport in 16 percent of the cases they lack their diplomas to uh, work as professionals abroad and i'm going to conclude my presentation i could like to Mm, reply to the questions I've been asked. I would like to say thank you, Joel, Carlos, Julissa, for your questions. And regarding agreements, we do have many agreements and conditions are terrible. Some conditions violate human rights and I'm not going to explain them here, but I would like to uh, go into detail because that is terrible. The Vienna Convention will declare uh, this, uh, its nullity. First of all, they should be taken into account, they should be considered migrant workers, take into account what the UN says, but e regarding the ILO, it's very important, but in order to file a complaint, this complaint should be accompanied by a union. So we should reach or create interest in a union to support our demand. And in that regard, any uh, aid the um, commission may offer, that could be great because Cuba has ratified basic ILO. Um, provisions. 
Regarding Carlos Bernal's uh, question, doctors are not protected. When they go abroad, it's very hard to explain what they have gone through. Repression is not uh, recognized by many countries. Spain is providing asylum because I'm involved. I constantly create certificates for that to happen in the US as well but we are constantly uh, issuing certificates for every case. Regarding Julissa Mantilla's question, sexual harassment, we ask 160 questions. And the question was, have I suffered or have I seen my colleagues suffer sexual harassment? And it's hard to go into that. I knew I know cases of rape by Venezuelan agents and Cuban agents. And in particular, a case I, I recall, I talked to this person. She was sold by the chief of the mission without her knowing that to a cartel in Guatemala. And she realized she had been exchanged as a favor and she was able to escape. And she went through a terrible situation. I have conversations with persons who have suffered too much. These were the questions, those are my answers, and I thank you for this opportunity to share all this with you. Thank you. Salem, please. Elena ah. Costa. Oh. Elena Costa. Uh, Elena. I'm sorry. Thank you for your question. Um, the answer is yes. This is something we have incorporated systematically, intersectional analysis in connection with legislation, policies, and practices and uh, care programs uh, that exist in Cuba. And we always see that not only from the perspective of the elderly but uh, care providers in general and what we have seen is a configuration of a pattern of vulnerability social vulnerability that is broadened to many uh, populations in a vulnerable situation this pattern is made up but uh, mono parental uh, families, black and mestizas families uh, with lack to access to labor rights, uh, female workers that are in the state sector, persons, uh, families who live in marginalized um, neighborhoods. There is an important aspect uh, in that regard because social rights in general uh, in connection with the internal migrants, this is being ignored and it affects uh, groups in a vulnerable situation. Families whose uh, one of their members he has been deprived of their liberty, persons with disabilities, 40% of households in Cuba have an elderly member and there are single parent families or households um, uh, that include an elderly person and they live in a very precarious situation. And these uh, vulnerability pattern affects and makes visible some vulnerabilities that affects groups such as women, black and mestiza women, elderly women, persons, uh, persons with disabilities, persons in, who live in the streets as well. I will now give the floor to Alain and afterwards to Sofia. I'm going to try to be brief. We want to thank you for the interest of the commission and regarding mobility. Well, I believe that one of the rights 
that is being violated has to do with access to faithful, reliable information. This makes us lack information about how these agreements are made. As Javier said, these doctors do not have a copy of their contracts. And I agree they they are annulled because they violate labor rights. And there is a clear responsibility of all um, countries of destination because in many of those cases, they participate in these uh, violations. We have seen that 17 medical doctors were um, retained by members of the uh, national security forces. This was allowed by Venezuelan authorities to athletes uh, that belong to the baseball team under the age of 23 suffer from this as well. And this uh, violation of the right to mobility affects many other people as well. We have seen that um, everyone in Cuba cannot access the right to mobility. And the worst part is that in most cases, they lack resources to uh, guarantee their rights. In Cuba, we have what is called administrative silence. Authorities are silent uh, for an undefined period of time affecting people. This affects mobility, but also academic freedom, labor rights. Our legislation is a legislation in which the regulatory body through the union sanctions, knows about the resources, about the remedies, and denies workers their rights. This is something we should bear in mind and that shows the importance of the lack of these effective remedies so that the uh, cultural, environmental, economic, and social rights are guaranteed. I would like to make a uh, comment regarding um, Mr. Baca's comments. I would like to mention the case of Ariel Piola, who was member of a research center in La Habana, and he was dismissed because he published a thesis questioning the environmental policy of the Cuban government. This caused um, problems to the income of the uh, Cuban government. The role as critical academic mem academic uh, made him a target of the government and he was constantly attacked. He was deprived of his liberty in 2018 and he was attacked because he was part of the LGBTI uh, community and he defended the right of the collective. Mr. Garcia was also a professor in Cuba. He was dismissed in 2016 because he published an essay analyzing the uh, social, economic, political reality in Cuba. According to Universidad de Oriente, created confusion because it was ambiguous and vague. Although the professor was part of the Communist uh, Party, the university considered that uh, this uh, professor had a negative influence on these, uh, on his students and he was not committed to the revolution we have the case of Amara Anabel Ramos Anabel Gallegos and these are part of the 32 cases we have registered in Aula Abierta and this uh, makes us highlight the role of critical members of university as a persons who have to be protected in this context or context of dictatorship because they're exposed in the production of critical scientific knowledge which makes them vulnerable to attacks by the state. Thank you. So we are about to conclude this hearing. Thank you for the information you have provided and for your constant work. I believe that apart from particular uh, circumstances, this information you have provided 
is very important to make this visible, to keep on working on these particular uh, cases. I would like to thank the rapporteur um, Soledad Garcia Munoz and the rapporteur for Cuba who coordinated efforts to carry out this um, hearing. We can see uh, care uh, policies, labor rights, the situation of self-employed persons, Regarding what Javier said, I believe that this investigation should include sexual violence because that can encompass all types of uh, sexual harassment, which includes uh, rape as well. So I would like to adjourn this hearing thanking the team and you and a message to all Cubans whether they are in Cuba or not, whether they had to leave the country, a message of hope. The Inter-American Commission has been accompanying you. We are doing everything we can do uh, through all our monitoring mechanism, including Cuba in the chapter 4B makes the situation in Cuba visible your voice the risk you are going through this is part of that commitment and the struggle towards uh, defending um, human rights we would like to express our solidarity and respect and gratefulness you are making history and you're on the right side of history thank you for this and i adjourn this hearing have a nice afternoon